Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I think we'll start. Um, I'm Gigi Barnhill, past president of the Historical Society. And today, I'm delighted to welcome Michael Thurston, who is the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor and chair of the Department of English Language and Literature at Smith College. He has served as director of the American Studies Program from 2010 to 2014 and is the author of several books and over a dozen articles on 20th century poetry. In the spring of 2016, Michael taught an enormously popular course on witches, witchcraft, and witch hunts in literature and culture. And today's presentation is drawn, I take it, from that course. <laughs> In their influential analysis of the Salem Witch Crisis, Paul Boyer and Stephen Nissenbaum offered events in Northampton as a telling counterexample to the rash of witchcraft accusations in the Eastern Bay Colony, where residents of Salem Town and Salem Village interpreted the visions and behavior of young women as evidence of a malevolent, invisible world, they argued. Residents of the Western Town understood similar phenomena as evidence of a nascent awakening of enthusiastic Christian faith. But was the Connecticut River Valley really free of what Cotton Mather called the devil's juggles? And what are juggles? <laughs> this talk surveys the appearance of witchcraft in the 17th century history of valley towns and villages, pointing out familiar patterns of accusation and interrogation. And just as events in Salem were reenacted and re-narrated by writers in the 19th and 20th centuries, we will see that events in Western Massachusetts and Connecticut, too, were transformed by later writers to serve those writers' own purposes. So please join me in welcoming. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for coming out on uh, a beautiful day. It's warmer in here than it is out there, and I'm going to assume that that's why you're all here. Um, everybody knows about Salem, and so I'm going to say very little about Salem, uh, except that I think Boyer and Nissenbaum are absolutely wrong when they start talking about Western Massachusetts. Um, and it's because they do this uh, anachronistic sleight of hand. So Salem versus Northampton, uh, to make the point that they make that what turns into sort of community destroying paranoia in Salem is evidence of the Great Awakening in Northampton also requires a fast forward of close to 100 years. So they're, com they're comparing uh, 18th century Northampton to late 17th century Salem, which is not a fair comparison. Uh, when you compare 17th century Salem and 17th century Connecticut Valley, the picture is really different. Uh, and in fact, and I'm, I'm going to come back to this at the end of the talk, the biggest witch panic in the New England colonies before Salem happens in Wethersfield, Connecticut. It uh, happens in Wethersfield, Connecticut in the 1660s for reasons I can try to suggest. Um, so we always think uh, Salem, the pattern that we're familiar with from Salem, uh, accusations typically focused on relatively powerless, marginal, single women, widows, or women who had never been married, women who didn't own property, um, as the sort of acting out of some other sort of social strife or struggle. That's a pattern that I think applies as much to um, the Connecticut Valley as it does to Salem in the 1690s. And so we'll, we'll come back to that too. Juggles, so that I can gloss that term from the beginning, uh, comes from Cotton Mather's account of the demonic possession, he thinks, of a young woman in Boston named Mercy Short. Uh, Mather is involved in something like the attempted exorcism of this demonic possession, and writes in his account, uh, I think the devil hath got in his juggles here. Uh, the devil is tricky. And this is one of the things that undergirds all of these New England assumptions about witches, and I'll come back to this later too, but the notion that the saints who had settled the New England colonies were constantly in battle, not only with enemies that they could see, natives here, for example, um, but also uh, with enemies they couldn't see. Mather writes about the wonders of the invisible world, in the sense that the saints, the Puritans, are embattled by the invisible world is what motivates a lot of these witch panics. I'm going to start with two close-to-home examples. Um, although, I should have had that up when I was talking about witchcraft in Salem. This is what we're all familiar with. 
This is what we get less familiar with as we move closer to home. Uh, there was an art exhibit at Historic Northampton two years ago, uh, paintings based on the case that I'm going to tell you a little bit about. This is the big Northampton example. And then I'll move across the river and we'll get closer to where we are. The best known instance of witchcraft accusation um, in Northampton is um, Mary Bliss Parsons. If Parsons is a familiar name to you, if you're interested in local history, it's the same family. The Parsons House, which is now part of the historic Northampton campus, uh, belongs to that family. There is, to this day, a Parsons Family Foundation in the area. Mary Bliss Parsons, part of that family. She's married to her husband, Cornette Joseph Parsons, in 1654. Joseph is a fur trader. He's a merchant. He worked with the Pinchon family in eastern Massachusetts. That's a name that might be familiar to you. Uh, from American literary transformations of witchcraft stories. Uh, judge Pinchon is uh, the, the sort of uh, hanging judge type in Hawthorne's um, House of the Seven Gables. Mary Bliss Parsons uh, is involved in a slander trial in 1656 in Northampton. Uh, and so early on seems to have gotten herself into some disagreeable relationships with members of the community. What this produces in 1674 is an accusation of witchcraft. She's accused, she's tried uh, in Northampton, and she's acquitted. This one has a happy ending. Um, and there, there are going to be three happy endings. This is happy ending number one. Um, hers is a slightly unusual case. Uh, most of the accusations, especially the early accusations that we know from other witch panics, and Salem is a good model for this, are single women, like I mentioned, and women who are marginal in their community. Uh, Mary Bliss Parsons is married. Uh, she's prosperous. She's a member of a powerful local family. Um, that might be a factor in her acquittal. She's got friends in high places. Uh, and, and this seems important because there are repeated rumors and repeated accusations. Um, and one last thing I want to say about, uh, two last things I want to say about this case. One, um, it's people are still talking about it. There's another talk at Historic Northampton about the Mary Bliss Parsons case this, this month. Um, and two, um, it's not the first case, and it's certainly not the worst case, of Connecticut River Valley uh, witchcraft accusations. One that has a much more complicated happy ending, but one that people also are still talking about, happens on this side of the river uh, about a half a generation later. And this is the case of Mary Reed Webster, uh, more commonly and colloquially known as Half-Hanged Mary. Is anybody familiar with the story of Half-Hanged Mary? Um, if you know the, the folklore podcast lore, there was an episode of the Lore podcast about Half-Hanged Mary. And if you're familiar with the Canadian author Margaret Atwood, um, Margaret Atwood uh, is a descendant of Mary Reed Webster and, uh, and wrote this poem, two parts of which I'll show you briefly, um, about these, uh, these events. Uh, Hadley doesn't come off very well in this story. <laughs> Any Hadley citizens? I apologize. Um, the account is in Mather's Memorable Provinces. Sorry, Memorable Providences. It's like a tongue twister. Um, the trial actually happens in Northampton. Uh, and she's acquitted in the trial, but that is not where the story ends. Uh, it's the typical sort of thing. There are accusations that she levitated. There are accusations that she uh, stopped cattle carts with a word, that she made cattle go into the river. And remember, livestock are wealth. And to lose cattle into the Connecticut River in the 1680s is to lose your livelihood or a big chunk of your livelihood. Uh, she's accused of overturning with a word a load of hay. According to Mather, um, she um, gets involved in a dispute with a deacon of the church and a member of the general court, a guy named Philip Smith. And um, she uh, bewitches him. She brings about, through some sort of spell or curse, an illness on him in, in January. And he cries out in delirium in what Mather describes as various language, complaining of pains and pins being stuck into him. That should sound familiar if you've read anything about Salem, right? Uh, witches are always sticking pins into <laughs> their victims. Um, Mather writes, there was also a strong smell of musk, of which no cause could be rendered. There's a noise of ticking that surrounds Philip Smith when he's lying in his sickbed. Uh, 
He has convulsions that seem like somebody's beating his head against the, the bedpost. And finally, he dies. Because there had been this disagreement, this big public lab disagreement between Mary Reeve Webster and Philip Smith, suspicion turns to her. So she's accused, Mather, upon the whole it appeared unquestionable that witchcraft had brought a period unto the life of so good a man. Mather always thinks it's unquestionable that witchcraft is involved in whatever it is that's going on. The villagers agree. So after she's tried and acquitted, a number of them go, take her out, uh, and do some local vigilante justice. They hang her from a tree. And they cut her down and they bury her in a snowbank. Remember, this is happening in January. Um, and the next morning, she comes walking into town. Um, it's half-hanged Mary. And she lives for 14 more years. So what I've got for you here are just a couple of excerpts from Atwood's poem. Uh, and what Atwood does is she sort of narrates in the poem the progression of events over this night. And what she does, because I'm a, a literature professor and a poetry scholar, like I can't do a talk without like one slight <laughs> moment of talking about a poem. Uh, and so what's cool about this poem is that the sentences are complete, the grammar is correct, the punctuation is there early in the poem. This is early in the night as events are just beginning. My throat is taut against the rope, choking off words and air. I'm reduced to knotted muscle. Blood bulges in my skull. My clenched teeth hold it in. I bite down on despair. By the time you get to 3 a.m., the punctuation disappears, uh, the sentences are incomplete, the grammar's incorrect. Uh, this is the mind in some ways being loosed from the body during its struggles uh, of strangulation or partial strangulation. Wind seethes in the leaves around me. The tree exudes night birds. Night birds yell inside my ears like stabbed hearts. My heart stutters in my fluttering cloth. Uh, and so it's a, I think, powerful evocation of this uh, near-death struggle that results in something like a figurative resurrection and Mary you know, limping back into Wintertime Hadley um, later in the morning to then live unbothered for another 14 years. Um, and uh, after she dies, she's buried in the cemetery that now is the one that you take the, the shortcuts that I take back over to Northampton. Uh, she's in that cemetery. I'm, I'm uh, I should say, indebted both to that lore podcast for turning me on to this story uh, and to um, a UMass student a few years ago uh, who, uh, when I was teaching my course at Northampton, or at Smith, alerted me to the story, uh, a young woman named Emily Kahn. So actually, the research here is hers. I'm uh, trying not to steal it by giving her due credit. But I want to get to Weathersfield, and we're going to get to Weathersfield through you know, the Connecticut Valley. And on the way to Weathersfield, I just want to make clear that the witchcraft stuff happens all over the place. So it's up here above the map in Northampton and Hadley, um, and it's down where I'm going to send us for most of the rest of this talk in Hartford and Wethersfield. But there are accusations in the colony down around New Haven. Um, there's accusations in Saybrook, uh, in um, uh, Bridgeport, in all kinds of towns that are down along the coast. Uh, in fact, one of those accusations uh, that led to uh, an execution is of a woman named Goody Bassett. Uh, this is in Bridgeport, and there is a, this stuff lingers right into the present day. There is, to this day, uh, an ice cream shop in Bridgeport. Um, it's called Goody Bassett's Old Fashioned Ice Cream Shop. Uh, you know it's old fashioned because it's uh, shoppy. Um, so, why is it? that everybody is so worried about witches. Uh, what is it that uh, produces these anxieties? Well, you've got to remember, and this I think gets harder and harder and harder for us to remember as we get farther and farther and farther from this. This is a time that in the words of the historian William Manchester is still a world lit only by fire. So when it gets dark, you've got the glow from the fireplace or maybe a little taper, uh, and that's about it. And on a moonless night in uh, still heavily forested New England, especially when you got far from the towns, uh, the dark seemed really solid and menacing, and it was full of stuff that was going to kill you. Um, that all is complicated 
by recent history. So there have, by the time you get to the 1640s in the New England colonies, there have been conflicts with natives. Uh, when the first Connecticut River Valley accusation and execution that I'm aware of happens in the 1640s, you're only 10 years or maybe slightly less than 10 years past the Pequot War on the East Coast. You're on the way toward what's going to be the explosion of warfare uh, between settlers and various tribes that comes to be called King Philip's War in the later 17th century. Um, so there's that ongoing sense of <coughs> combat and, and struggle and recent history. Um, and you've got internal worries in these Puritan communities. 1620, the establishment of the, um, the Plymouth Colony. In the 1620s, the establishment of the, uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You've got this sense that we, the saints, the dissident separatists who have left England, are here, and we are establishing what John Winthrop calls a city on a hill. Within 15, 20 years, William Bradford, the governor of the Plymouth Colony, is writing in his history of the colony about the disintegration and the dissolution of the purity of that community as both a second generation uh, is growing up in that community and hasn't yet had the testified experience of the presence of the divine that gives them full membership in the church and full membership because this is a theocracy. Full membership in the church also means full citizenship. So you have a bunch of people who are in but not completely of the community and you've got a bunch of indentured servants and others. You've got merchants and others who have come there who don't share the Puritans' beliefs but are there either out of necessity or to make money. You've got transported criminals right, who are part of the community. So there's a lot of anxiety starting in the 1640s about how we are falling apart as God's chosen people. When the English Revolution that results in the execution of Charles I and the Puritan rule of England uh, for about 15 years, when that ends and there's the reestablishment of uh, monarchy in England, that's seen as a big setback to the forces of uh, the people who thought they were the chosen people. All of these, I think, produce anxieties that then require the, the nomination and the handling of a scapegoat figure. Out of all these anxieties, and I'm giving you all this background because I think it matters for Weathersfield. Out of all these anxieties, you get the sort of thing that happens in Weathersfield. To make it more specific, to get down to there. Why Hartford and Wethersfield in the early 1660s? In the early, early 1660s, you have the dissolution of the community that Bradford has been worried about for 20 years. Bradford's no longer around, but he starts worrying about it in the 1640s. You've got um, difficulties over um, attempts like we have coming out of Northampton later in the 17th century attempts to grant citizenship and membership of the church community to people who haven't had that testified experience of the presence of the divine. This is the halfway covenant, if you're familiar with that. I'm not going to get into the halfway covenant. We can talk about it later if you like. Um, we have a specific controversy in Hartford in the 60, early 1660s. That's around these questions of church authority, the relationship of church authority to civic authority, the relationship of church membership to civic <laughs> membership. Um, there's a contest for leadership of the church in Hartford that begins in 1656. There's a lot of local resentment as happens, right? The losing side isn't sat satisfied with the settlement of that controversy. There's anxiety about the restoration of the English throne to Stuart monarchs in the 1660s, in 1660 itself. Put that together with the river floods every once in a while, uh, outbreaks of illness every once in a while. Uh, starvation that happens, or the near starvation that happens when you're living in a subsistence farming economy, and the conditions are ripe for the explosion of witchcraft accusations that happens in Weathersfield in the 1660s. Um, for example, uh, you get a couple. It's, it's, it's not uncommon that couples end up being accused together. And you get a couple named Rebecca and Nathaniel Greensmith in Weathersfield. The Greensmiths are tried and executed both in Hartford, part of this rash of accusations that, uh, that racks Weathersfield. Um, they're socially, socially marginal. Nathaniel Greensmith had been convicted of theft before. Uh, he stole a hoe. He'd been convicted of uh, perjury. He'd been convicted of battery. 
Uh, Rebecca, his wife, is described by John Whiting, who's the minister of Hartford's First Church as, and this is a quotation, lewd, ignorant, and considerably aged. Right? So exactly, I mean, that it, we can laugh, but this is exactly the kind of woman who gets accused early on in Salem. Uh, Bridget Bishop, who's a tavern keeper on the Ipswich Road in Salem, gets described as, in terms of lewdness and age. Uh, so this is something that we're going to become all too familiar with. Um, the accusations arise from the same sort of circumstances that we're very familiar with. A uh, young girl got sick in the community. She had fits. She complained uh, that somebody was tormenting her. She points at the greensmiths. Um, she channels voices that couldn't have been her own. She spoke in a heavy Dutch accent, according to uh, the description of this, when there were no Dutch people around from whom she would have heard this Dutch accent. Uh, this is a young woman named Anne Cole, by the way. Uh, and when Rebecca Greensmith is charged with this and questioned, she confesses, saying the devil had first appeared to her in the form of a talking fawn, and that she and the fawn devil had met frequently, and the fawn devil had frequent use of her body with much seeming but indeed horrible hellish delight to her. That's a okay. <laughs> wow. That's not me, that's, that's the doctor. Um, so she seals her fate pretty early on. <coughs> um, and then she said, out of love to her husband's soul, and though it was much against her will, she had to confess that he too had been familiar with the devil. And this also is a dynamic that we see over and over again. One accusation leads to another accusation leads to another accusation. And so Nathaniel uh, gets accused by Rebecca in these terms. This is a long quotation, but it's kind of fun. About three years ago, as I think it, my husband and I were in the woods several miles from home and were looking for a sow that we lost, and I saw a creature, a red creature, following my husband. And when I came to him, I asked him what it was that was with him, and he told me it was a fox. Another time, when I drove our hogs into the woods beyond the pound that was to keep young cattle several miles off, I went before the hogs to call them, and looking back, I saw two creatures, like dogs, one a little blacker than the other. They came after my husband pretty close to him, and one did seem to me to touch him. I asked him what they were, and he told me he thought foxes. I was still afraid when I saw anything, because I heard so much of him before I married him. So he's got a bad reputation, right? Theft, perjury, battery. Um, I have seen logs that my husband hath brought home in his cart that I wondered at it that he could get them into the cart, being a man of little body and weak to my apprehension. And the logs were <laughs> such that I thought two men such as he could not have done it. So uh, if you're a weakling, but you have feats of strength, right, that's grounds for accusation. And if you remember George Burroughs uh, in Salem, George Burroughs, who was a minister, who had been a minister in a community on what's now the main coast of, along Casco Bay, uh, that's part of the accusation of Burroughs. He's, he's too strong. Uh, and in fact, the same sort of evidence, too, too strong because he can throw logs around. Um, the greensmiths end up uh, spreading this web of accusation. So eight more accusations uh, that lead to trial in 1662 alone. So predating Salem by a generation, uh, the hartford Weathersfield panic leads to all these accusations and four executions. Um, Do, are any of those accusations to people who accused them in, in kind of a roundabout way? Yeah. Uh, so somebody gets accused by Rebecca Greensmith and then says, well, yeah, but Rebecca Greensmith was, as she just told you, part of this witch's Sabbath that happened on Christmas. Uh, and uh, yeah, there is that community turning against itself and everybody turning against each other. Um, John Taylor, a 19th century writer who uh, has a book called The Witchcraft Delusion in Connecticut, concludes, it must be clearly borne in mind that all these men, he means the magistrates and jurors, in Wethersfield. In this, as in all other witchcraft trials in Connecticut, at, uh, I'm sorry, were absolute believers in the powers of Satan and his machinations through witchcraft, and the evidence then adduced to prove them and trained to such credulity by their education and experience and by their theological doctrines and by the law of the land in Old England. So it's worth remembering that um, these are people who still think of themselves as English people, uh, the English king at the turn of the 17th century, um, uh, King James I, who had been King James VI of Scotland, writes a book about witches and witchcraft, believes completely in witches and witchcraft. There are witch panics 
in rural England, uh, especially in rural northern England, throughout the 17th century. And these people are familiar with that. Put that together with the puritanical belief that you're at war with an invisible kingdom. And of course, when stuff starts to go badly, you're going to turn to this notion of witchcraft. I want to end. By the way, we can go back and talk about any of the stuff you want. Um, but I, I want to get to my favorite story, um, because this one is the especially fun one. I want to end with one more happy ending. The Greensmiths, not so happy. Uh, for uh, two other executions in the um, Hartford Weathersfield area. A lot of those uh, southern coastal ex or accusations that I mentioned lead to executions. And that string of accusations that uh, we see happening in Hartford and Weathersfield happens down in Bridgeport as well. Um, I always want to point at the screen, but uh, that's not going to be good. My favorite in Weathersfield is a woman named Katherine Harrison. Uh, and Harrison's case loops us back to Mary Bliss Parsons in some ways. It's kind of similar. Um, she's pretty well off. She's not a marginal person. Um, she had inherited a good deal of wealth upon her husband's death, though. And so she's well off, but that sense that maybe she got it in some uh, you know, uh, malevolent way is something that has caused her suspicion. Suddenness with which she comes by her wealth provokes some resentment in the community. She, more importantly, had a history, this is also like, um, like Mary Bliss Parsons, a history of litigious relationships with her neighbors, some suing and some countersuing. Um, she gets acquitted. I'll give the happy ending away uh, in advance. And I think that happy ending um, is why when we get into the 1950s and Elizabeth George Spear writes a book called The Witch of Blackbird Pond, which is set around Wethersfield, Connecticut, things end happily for the accused witch figure there. Uh, I'm going to come back to the Witch of Blackbird Pond in a minute, but I think the happy ending of the Mary Harrison case, um, Sir Catherine Harrison case, is part of why Spear is able to imagine a happy ending. Um, unlike Parsons, um, Harrison practiced folk medicine with herbs and plants, and this might be part of what's behind the witchcraft charges. Her case went on for two years, there are more than 30 witnesses who testify against her. Um, and this long duration of the trial probably saved her life. Mm -hmm. Because it enabled the magistrate, John Winthrop, not the same John Winthrop who was the governor of the Massachusetts State Colony, but related, uh, who, had, who was away when the trial began, gave him time to get back. Mm -hmm. And when he gets back, he makes an important change in witchcraft law that is the significance of the Harrison case. First trial uh, ends with no verdict. The second trial um, gives us a bunch more testimony, and this is the one that the historian John Taylor uh, waxes enraged about in his account of what he calls the witchcraft delusions in Connecticut. He calls it drivel, the travesties of common sense, the mockeries of truth, which fell from the lips of the witnesses. For example, a guy named Thomas Bracey blames Catherine Harrison for his repeated failures properly to sew a jacket. <laughs> he kept getting the sleeves wrong and had to keep ripping them apart, and it was her fault. <laughs> I'm not making any of this up. <laughs> Richard Montague says he encountered Harrison, and she told him that a swarm of her bees had flown over a neighbor's lot and into a meadow and finally across the river, but she had fetched them back again. And he said, this seems strange and unlikely and impossible, and so there could have been no lawful means for her to do so. She must be a witch. <laughs> Jacob Johnson's wife claimed that Harrison was responsible for her nosebleed. Mary Hale woke up one November night after hearing a noise and found a creature had fallen upon her legs, quote, with such violence that she feared it would have broken her legs, and then it came upon her stomach and oppressed her, so as if it would have pressed the breath out of her body. And this ugly shaped thing, like a dog, had a head that Hale, quote, clearly and distinctly knew to be the head of Catherine Harris. Mm -hmm. who was at that time in prison, so it had to be a spectral appearance. The depositions go on and on like this. And what's great is the documents give us Harrison's rejoinders, mm -hmm. as well as the accusations. And she's fantastic. I want somebody to make like a movie about the trial of Catherine Harrison. Because, for example, when Mary Hale says, I woke up on this November night and there was a dog-shaped thing on my chest and I knew that the face was the face of Catherine Harrison, she says, to Mary Hale's testimony, I say there is no truth in it, so far as I have mentioned in it, and I desire it may be considered how any person can affirm that by a small firelight, 
They can clearly and distinctly know my head on a dog. I know not the meaning of these things. Besides, and here's the really good part, I cannot but look at it as an accusation against me, and I do not know that I ever was in that house but once, and that was when I went to demand a debt due to me. Right, so Harrison is getting at the real reason for this accusation is because these people owe me money. This goes back and forth for a while. It gives Winthrop an opportunity to get back to town. And the great thing about when Winthrop gets back to town is he says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've been convicting people on what's called spectral evidence. The only evidence that people have that witchcraft has happened is one person claims to have seen some demonic act, some malevolent act, some appearance of a specter. Um, and we as law-abiding people, we as people who pay attention to legal procedure, can't convict people on that sort of ground. And so they make an important change in witchcraft law. And that is spectral evidence, um, where there's no physical evidence, where all you have is spectral evidence. Um, this is ghosts, spirits, dreams, visions in the absence of a body. That's hearsay. And as hearsay, it's unreliable. And as unreliable, it can't convict. Uh, and so a bunch of them get together and they say, we've got to rewrite the law so that convictions aren't possible on the basis simply of spectral evidence, which is hearsay. A guy named Gershom Bolkley, who is an important reverend in the community, uh, writes, if proof of the fact do depend wholly up upon testimony, then there is a necessity of plurality of witnesses to testify to one and the same individual fact. And without such plurality, there can be no legal evidence of it. So Gershom Bolkley, the local minister, with Winthrop, rewrites the witchcraft trial law to require corroboration. If you're depending on spectral evidence, two people have to have witnessed the same spectral occurrence in order to convict. Two things I want to say about this. One, this doesn't help anybody in Salem. Because, and this is the law by the time we get to Salem, because the accusers all corroborate each other. right? All the young women who uh, originate the accusations um, back each other up. I saw that too. That's all it takes to get 20-odd uh, people hanged in Salem. Uh, number two, Elizabeth George Spear in The Witch of Blackbird Pond makes Gershom Bolkley a character. He, at the end, um, it, it's a weird historical sleight of hand she does. She sets it more uh, close to Salem than to the events in Wethersfield. Uh, so you get no mention of the fact that there are actually witchcraft accusations and executions in Wethersfield. But we're in Wethersfield. There's a local woman who kind of like Mary Harrison, I keep calling her Mary, kind of like Catherine Harrison, um, does folk medicine right, with herbs and things like this. She's the titular witch, she's the one who gets accused, along with the young woman who is the, the heroine of the novel. Um, they get saved by the benign presence of Gershom Bulkley, who is working not only as the local minister, but as the magistrate, uh, who is the voice of reason. And this, I think, is Elizabeth George Spear writing for a young audience in the late 1950s, the, the anti-crucible. Arthur Miller looks back at Salem in the midst of the McCarthyite anti-communist inquisition of the 1950s and says, yup, that's us. This is what we do. We make accusations that have no foundation and we destroy people's lives and reputations. Elizabeth George Spear is saying, what is us is the voice of the grown-up who comes in to this uh, world of accusation and reinforces the rule of law, requires actual civil procedure, calms everybody down. And this is what I think she and the Newberry Committee that gives that novel the Newberry Award um, think is socially necessary for young audiences at that moment. That our past as a nation with witchcraft can mean multiple things and gets deployed to mean different things at different moments in our history or different competing things at the same moment in our history. Um, but Wethersfield, just like Salem, lives on in the cultural memory Salem via Arthur Miller and the movie that's made of The Crucible, the continuing productions of The Crucible. If you haven't seen the YouTube clip of The Crucible uh, with Ted Cruz when he was a student at Harvard, I highly recommend looking that one. Um, but also the history of Wethersfield via Elizabeth George Spear and a book like The Witch of Blackbird. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Wow.
Any oh, questions? Please. Yeah. Are you doing your witchcraft course again this spring? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a five college student? Yeah. Yeah, come on over. Uh, and most of this was not in that one because I learned about it since then. So. I had this idea we were going to do a field trip to Salem when I taught that course the first time because I thought, you know, 20, 25 people will sign up. It was 95 of us. <laughs> so instead, I had to go to Salem on this really cold day and take a bunch of photographs to bring back to Salem. <laughs> But I think we might do a, a quick field trip over to that cemetery, uh, to, if I can find, so that we can go and visit the grave of half there. Mm -hmm. Yeah? So, why did the witchcraft trials and stuff um, in Salem take? Why did that seize the modern historical? It's bigger. It's bigger I think it's bigger, more. and it, it's reach. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts off, well, let's see. I, th I think. There's a bunch of reasons, and I'll try to give you the couple that I think are most important. One, Salem is just a more central location for the colony than a place like Weathersfield. Um, it's a port, it's, so it's a place where the colony is involved in international trade and affairs and communication. Um, it's closer to Boston, so it's closer to the seat of colonial power. Um, so that's one reason why it takes hold. Um, the other is it just it go, goes out of control and gets much bigger. So you've got eight or nine accusations, a smaller number of trials, four executions, uh, one important escape, and a couple of acquittals in Weathersfield, right? Um, in Salem, 20 odd executions, over 100 who were accused and imprisoned at some point, and more than that, by the time it all ends and what maybe brings it to an end, is the accusations are flying fast and furious, not only between Salem Town and Salem Village, um, but down to Boston. So they start accusing people like the wife of the colonial governor, mm -hmm. and saying, I saw the wife of the colonial governor who flew from Boston on her broomstick <laughs> to attend a witch's Sabbath in Salem. And at that point, the colonial government is like, we are shutting this down. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, I mean, it's not okay with me necessarily, but the colonial government before that is like, you guys take care of it. And Mather goes and you know thinks he can uh, bring some sort of reason to it. But Mather is also a true believer in witchcraft. Right? Um, and Hale goes and thinks he can bring some you know some reason there. Uh, and it's just crazy times in Salem. And I think it's crazy times. Boyer and Nissenbaum's argument is that it's it's economically fueled. It's it's the town versus the village. It's the farming community versus the port. The port is where all the money and the power are. There's real resentment by the farming community. And a lot of the accusations, they, they have this great map in the book uh, where they plot a lot of the accusations as coming from one side of the boundary just over at targets on the other side of the boundary. Steve was a historic mm. consultant for a GBH production. Mm. Three Sovereigns for... Three Sovereigns for Sarah. Sarah. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's available anywhere, but that's kind of a fascinating oh, yeah. look. Oh, yeah. And you mentioned financial part of and that, the three sovereigns. That's the plot there. Yeah. It's all yeah. about land ownership. Yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you. Yes. I have a question. Um, how were these executions done? Now, um, I heard, I come from Europe, I'm a visitor here, that the, um, most witches were burned at the stake. Did this happen in Salem and in other places too? Hanging. Or hanging? Hanging. Was it a public entertainment? Was it public? Did people come and look on them? They were public, yeah. yeah. And it was public as a sort of instruction to the community. Um, and similarly to, to the burning of witches uh, associated with a, a sermon would often be preached um, with this as an object lesson. Uh, this is the nature of the evil in our midst. This is what we do to protect ourselves as a community. Don't be like her. Yeah. And dis disposal of those hanged bodies, or was it typical? Um, Since they didn't burn them, obviously. They didn't, the no, they, they, they buried them. Yeah, um, and buried them sort of in marginal places, not in the prominent places in the local churchyard. Yeah. Um, with the case of like of Half Hang Mary, what did like what was the community's reaction when she just like walked back into the yeah. town? Like, would it be like, oh, you definitely witch <laughs> now? <That's what> <laughs> <laughs> not really recorded, and and that's what's fascinating is like you know, did these guys clear out because you know they knew now that the the witch was in town and they weren't going to be able to conquer her. Um, the documents kind of go quiet after she comes back to town, other than she lived for another 14 years. <laughs> yeah. She survived the ordeal. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose that would yes, be yes, the, yes, the, yes. Uh, the analytical way to, to think of it, is you've got this notion of trial by ordeal. Uh, this is that famous thing, uh, you know, if you like, throw a witch in the water, if That's she right. floats, she's a witch. If she drowns, she was probably innocent. And, uh, and in this case, she sur by surviving the hanging, she survives the fallible judgment of the community and demonstrates her innocence. Yeah. Although I, the documents don't say that, but I think that's the right reading but of the community's response. That's a much older tradition. But yeah, yeah. Yes? That was my question, but I also, how does this compare to um, the witches in Europe <coughs> at an earlier time? Mm -hmm. They, I don't know, I heard that mostly they were the old women who had the, the herbal secrets. Mm -hmm. They could actually heal people legitimately, but they were some kind of a threat to the church, and that's why they were burned, or this seems like a very different thing than what happened here in New England. Different with some similarities, I think. Um, so the historiography of European witchcraft is, is really rich and fascinating, and you've got a couple of competing accounts. One is that uh, there's the, the church authority which is systematic and hierarchical and traces you know, everything back to Rome ultimately, uh, in conflict with local nature wisdom that tends to be in the hands of local women. And that is seen as an affront to the, the hierarchical order of the church and has to be, especially during the Inquisition, uh, has to be extirpated as heretical. You also, you have an account, and I'm blanking on the name of the woman in the 1920s who, who publishes a really briefly influential book um, that takes that, those local communities of women with natural herbal sorts of knowledge and folk medicine and turns them into a whole sort of competing um, institution. Uh, so that it's not just that you know, there's a, a Nona here and another here, but that you've got uh, a whole continent-wide network that is, in fact, like a shadow church, and that the reason why and and is older, right? So it's a it's a women's priesthood of this natural religion that goes back to before Christianity that has lasted through the 15 centuries of Christianity at that point. And for that reason, poses a big threat and has to be extirpated by the church. That gets pretty quickly discredited, but it's really popular. Um, how is it similar to what happens in the colonies? I think you've got a, uh, an anxious and beset hierarchical male-focused authority um, that has from early on had to withstand challenges to its authority, often from women, right? So if, um, if the Massachusetts Bay Colony can be really sort of shaken to its foundations by somebody like Anne Hutchinson uh, and the antinomian controversy that sort of roils around her, then whatever sort of church authority we have is really fragile and vulnerable. And the fragility and vulnerability are both kind of exacerbated by the fact that the threat can be located in women, but then containable by the fact that the threat can be located in women because they're easier to manage. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're marginal, nobody's going to stand up for them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a real similarity, I think, mm -hmm. across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there an economic component to this? Like, to me, when you keep saying, whether you're talking about herbalist women, or women who who have inherited a large. And it seems to me that those women um, are becoming powerful in their communities, either by influence or by actual money. Oh yeah. And certainly, if you're going to a herbalist, you're probably remunerating them in some way. They're mm -hmm. probably running a little economy of their own. This network of so they're also powerful, gaining their own power from their own work. Yeah. I think absolutely. They're gaining their power from their own work. I mean, there's not like a medical establishment that they're threatening because there aren't doctors, really, or anything like that. But I think this notion that an, an autonomous woman, able to support herself mm -hmm. without a husband, without taking care of a family, that's destabilizing and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And that she does so 
through this arcana that we don't understand, that seems to, um, to be able to do things that you know, we can't do, that all makes it even more destabilizing. Were men ever accused of being witches? Yes. Uh, how did the accusations of men go? Men accused in Europe. Not men. But it happens, and what usually um, happens is, I, I mentioned couples, right? So the greensmiths, that's true. Right. Yeah, that's true. Uh, or the proctors yeah, yeah. in Salem. Uh, the men usually get dragged in as trailing spouses. <laughs> and so you have whole family executions, uh, which is in Europe. That doesn't happen anywhere that we've found in the colonies. Um, but there's a, a, a great book about 30 years ago called High Road to the Stake uh, that follows a specific I think it's maybe in what's now the, no, it's not the Netherlands. It's some German principality. And there's this witchcraft accusation and trial that ends up encompassing a whole family, mother, mother, father, and a couple of children who are tortured and finally executed. Oh, yeah. I think the difference between Boston, Salem, and Plymouth uh, is that Bradford and, and other officials in Plymouth from the very beginning had to deal with the Billington family. Mm -hmm. So here was, here was this family of drunkards, reprobates, uh, reprobates yeah. first murderer in the colonies, mm -hmm. but they were the ones who survived that first week, mm -hmm. like no other family in Plymouth. So, Only the good die young. <laughs> so, so they had this this unsightly element mm -hmm. right from the beginning that had a vigor of its own, mm -hmm. and it survived. And they had to manage it. And they had to manage it. They needed those secular people who had crafts skills that they could not do without. They also were fortunate in the, the appearance of a sort of unifying external enemy in, in the shape of Thomas Morton. Um, so, so Plymouth both has its internal uh, dissenters that they find ways to manage without killing them, right? Because they need every living body to continue living. And they have Morton who is, um, you know, I, actually kind of a hero of mine, but uh, he's, he's an unscrupulous trader who wants to make money in this new English Canaan, and he's willing to buy off the natives, and he's the one who sets up a maypole uh, and, and teaches the natives to dance around it, and uh, the pilgrims have to go and chop down the maypole and imprison Morton. Um, but, they can, but that brings them all together because they have him as the, the external enemy. He's also a defrocked Anglican priest, right? so he, he represents everything they hate. But Plymouth already has Atherton. Yeah, yeah. Um, Plymouth is, is lucky that there's a lot that keeps them sort of together and internally focused. Um, it's also another 50 years go by before Salem, right? So everything has gotten big and prosperous, and and the communities are big enough now to turn against each other. Yeah. What about in Canada, a French Canadian community? Anything like that? I don't know. <laughs> my, my, my expertise ends at the Canadian work. Um, you know, th it's a good question. I don't know. Uh, my suspicion is probably unlikely to have a whole lot of it because um, those are communities that are really built on trade and uh, their motives for settlement from the beginning are different from those in the New England colonies. And so they don't have this we are saints and chosen people thing to get all anxious and upset about. Right? We're just, we want to kill as many beavers as we possibly can. Yeah, and witchcraft has nothing to do with it. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have a question about, about midwives. Now, um, in Europe they said that many women who were midwives, mm -hmm. and of course in those days a birth was given uh, with the help of a midwife rather mm -hmm. than a doctor. But uh, then um, the, the uh, importance of um, assuming that all the medical power was in the hands of men created another possible reason for declaring a woman a witch because she was a, a, a gifted midwife mm -hmm. who also probably knew by her health and knowledge how to do abortions, mm -hmm. which, in those, which was a, a great sin. And, 
Uh, Carlo Ginsburg links midwifery to the witchcraft accusations in Europe. Yeah. Um, one of the accused women in Salem may have um, done some midwifery in that community. That seems to be about it. It doesn't seem to be the same sort of factor in the colonial accusations that, that Ginsburg at least argues it is in a lot of the European ones. Well, thank you ever so much. Absolutely.